Carlisle against the world. William Gardner ran under the ball and made a catch for a 40-yard gain. Never had such a large crowd seen such a long pass. It will be talked about often this year, wrote the Philadelphia North American. No such punny little pass as Penn makes, but a lordy throw, a hurl that went further than many a kick. The stands went quiet. The Penn players looked to the sidelines for guidance. None was coming. The coaches had never seen this type of offense. With Penn on its heels, Mount Pleasant orchestrated what sports writers began calling whirlwind football, mixing inside power rushes, outside speed runs, and long forward passes. Albert Extende led a smothering, gang-tackling defense, and about 150 Carlisle students cheered and sang a song that they had written just for the occasion. We've come to Philly Billy to beat Old Penn. Well, noted the Philadelphia Inquirer, they beat Old Penn all right. Carlisle was up 16-0 by halftime. The second half was more of the same. I'd see the ball sail in my direction, Penn's All-State fullback William Holdenback said, of the beating he and his teammates took that day. And at the same time came the thundering of what appeared to be a tribe of Indians racing full tilt to my direction. When this gang hits you, they simply wiped you out. From Pop Warner's sideline viewpoint, Penn's utter confusion was a thing of beauty. Poor Pennsylvania finally reached a point where their players ran around in circles, emitting wild yelps, he later said. Even Jim Thorpe got in on the fun. Sort of. His first carry, he was hit for a loss. I got excited, Thorpe remembered. It didn't follow my own interference. It was a problem. The young back hadn't learned to wait for the blockers to open holes. It was a problem for another day. Carlisle won the game 26-6, and it wasn't even that close. The Indians gave 402 yards to Penn's 76, picked up 22 first down to Penn's 3. The football world was in shock. The Carlisle Indians were no longer delightful nomads of the gridiron, no longer just an amusing traveling show. Playing a brand new style of football, they had just humiliated one of the country's elite schools on its own field. They had officially crashed the Big Four party. The greeting was hostile, and in some cases downright racist. With racial savagery and furiosity, the Carlisle Indian 11 grabbed Penn's football scalp and dragged their victim up and down Franklin Field, wailed the Philadelphia Press. Never has Pennsylvania lost a football game that created greater surprise. Six days later, Warner and the team walked into the lobby of a New York City hotel. Newspaper men were waiting, wanting to know if Pop thought his men could clobber his next opponent, Princeton, as it had Penn. You know I never make predictions, Warner said, but we'll show the crowd that goes to see us play a bully good game. A swarm of fans formed around Mount Pleasant, Extende, Hauser, and on the other stars. Jim Thorpe was there too, though it's unlikely anyone knew who he was. Here you fellows, off to bed with you, Warner told the team. Turning back to the reporters, he said, They've had a hard day's ride, over six hours in cramped cars, and they need their rest. Princeton players slept in their own beds that night. The team and coaching staff had spent all week preparing for Carlisle, and they got plenty of help. Coaches rushing to Princeton's aid. That Wednesday's New York Times had announced, Aim to crush the Indians. As the story explained, coaches of the other teams sent suggestions for beating Carlisle, and former players returned to campus to help at practice. It was even rumored that one of Penn's game refs slipped the coach a detailed report of the Carlisle playbook. But none of this helped Princeton nearly as much as a factor beyond anyone's control. Ten hours before the game, it started to pour. The rain was still falling when the gates of the polo grounds opened on Saturday afternoon. The field was a swampy mess of sick glass and bare mud, and Carlisle's first play from scrimmage told the story. Pete Hauser took a pitch and swept to the right. The blocking was good, and there was a clear path around the edge. But when Hauser planted a foot to cut up field, he slipped and went down without being touched. This was no day for whirlwind football. The bigger Princeton team took advantage, settling into a back-and-forth field position battle, avoiding mistakes, waiting for a break. They got one when Frank Mount, Pleasant, fell in a puddle as he tried to field a punt. Princeton recovered the loose ball and scored the game's first touchdown. Princeton students broke out in song. He may have beaten dear old Penn, but he can't do a thing against the Princeton men. Poor Mr. Indian. Tigers humble the Indians, announced the New York Times headline. Princeton did it, chimed the Syracuse Herald. Solved Indian problem. The sports world celebrated Princeton's 16-0 thumping of Carlisle as if an annoying upstart had been shoved back into its place. 
as if it was Carlisle against the world. Pop Warner spent much of the train ride home from New York consoling his downhearted team. He was mighty low himself, having just watched his dream of an undefeated season drowned in the sea of mud. He was a hard loser, a close friend of Pop's would later say. A very hard loser. The only thing to do was move on. The season wasn't over. In just six days, Carlisle would be back on the train, headed for Boston, this time for their third Big Four matchup in 15 days. After weeks of exhausting travel, punishing games, emotional highs and lows, they were going back to Harvard, where the record was 0-10. and Warner had once bought into the old stereotype of Indians giving up when the going got tough. Some still believed it. Their weakness, pronounced the New York Times after the Princeton game, has been the inability to maintain an effective team effort in the face of discouragement. It was a totally bogus charge. Even in their one defeat, Carlisle played to the final whistle, diving for loose balls long after any hope of winning was gone. But anyway, if the Carlisle Indians had any quit in them, now was the time it would show. The skies above Harvard Stadium were clear and blue, as Pop Warner and the Carlisle Indian team jogged into a beautifully firm field of grass. They looked up at the massive horseshoe-shaped stands of the biggest football arena in the country, packed, Warner recalled, with 30,000 Crimson Rooters, joyously and continually crooning Harvard songs. Good thing this isn't a singing contest, hey, Pop? One of the players joked. Frank Mount Pleasant was in no mood to last. Remember last Saturday, he called to his teammates. Right from the opening kick, Carlisle was back on track. The Harvard defense came out expecting pass plays, and Mount Pleasant caught them off guard by opening with runs. Then, when the defenders began bunching closer to the line of scrimmage to stop the run, Mount Pleasant threw passes out of what looked like running formations. A Boston Globe reporter looked on amaze. They did not hang out a sign and say, Again, this time expect a forward pass, wrote the Globe. They concealed, most skillfully, the point of attack. For the past 40 years, it had always been easy to tell what an offense was about to do. Carlisle was changing everything. A 20-yard pass to Albert Extende set up Pete Hauser's short plunge over the goal line for a quick 6-0 lead. Oh, wait till Harvard wakes up, a crimson van was heard bragging. Then you will see the power of the white man assert itself. The Indians will soon give up. Harvard answered, marching down the field to tie it up. But Carlisle struck right back with another touchdown. Harvard kicked a field goal now worth four points, right before the half ended. At the break, it was Carlisle 12, Harvard 10. The intensity only increased in the second half. Between plays, Mount Pleasant stalked up and down the Carlisle line shouting, Remember last Saturday! It was the quarterback himself who broke the game's biggest play. Standing at his own 25, he fielded a Harvard punt and sidestepped the charging tackler. The next defender leaped at him, but he ducked low, and the Harvard man flipped over his back and thudded to the turf. Then Mount Pleasant took off on what the Boston Globe would describe as a zigzagging sprint, or as the New York Tribune put it, he went through the greater portion of the Harvard 11 like a greased pig. Of his 85-yard touchdown run, Mount Pleasant simply said, I only saw the goalposts in front of me and I made for them. Jim Thorpe celebrated from the bench. Carlisle was one step closer to the biggest win in school history, but he could only watch. Harvard struck back, cutting Carlisle's lead to 18, 18 to 15. There were just a few minutes left. This was a key moment, that pivotal moment in a tense game when the underdog gets tight, plays safe, and blows it. Not this time. We've got to score again, Mount Pleasant roared in the huddle. The team responded with another long drive. When they got to the Harvard 35, Mount Pleasant faked a handoff and dropped back to pass, looking for Extende deep down the field. Seeing that Extende was covered, Mount Pleasant flipped a short throw to the running back, Bill Winnie, who scampered all the way to the Harvard 4. Pete Hauser punched it in, sealing the win. The final? Carlisle, 23. Harvard, 15. When the whistle blew, thousands of fans jumped out of the stands to congratulate the Carlisle players, surrounding them as they limped off the field. At Carlisle, the celebration lasted into the night. Students sewed and stuffed a human-shaped dummy, dressed it in a crimson sweater with a big H on the front, and set it on a stretcher. Then the school marching band grabbed the instruments and led a spontaneous parade through town. The next issue of Carlisle's student paper said it all. The Big Four, now the Big Five.